few days ago, I had a chance to sit down for a 30-minute one-on-one interview with Prime Minister Trudeau. Now, we discussed everything from the economy and inflation to the controversial Bill 21 to his own political future. But I began the conversation asking about the issue impacting everyone's lives right now, the pandemic. Let's go to the pandemic. Um, gosh, we thought we were out of it. And now here we are with Omicron. What's the projection on how long this lasts for? What is the government prepared to cover? We made a simple promise to Canadians at the beginning of the pandemic that we would have their backs as much as it took for as long as it took. And it's not just about doing the nice thing. It's about knowing that when you support people through a crisis like this, you bounce back stronger whenever that ends up happening. So as long as the pandemic lasts, we will be there to support Canadians because that will ensure that the rebound, that the economy comes roaring back as quickly as possible. It's already something we're seeing. But how long? I mean, what do you, what's the project? Are we out of this in people? That's all we get at. Are we out of this in January? Are we out of this by uh, next year? What's I, your projection? I remember you asking me that right. question in mid-2020. Right. Uh, you asked me again at the end of 2020 in our at Christmas. How long? Everyone wants to know. The scientists all have different different timelines, different potentials. It depends how bad Omicron is. They're still trying to do the, the tests on it. We're definitely in it for a while longer. But what I can control and what the government can control is saying we will be there to support Canadians as long as it takes. One way out is boosters. Mm -hmm. And we're behind the UK and the US in giving our boosters. Why didn't we roll, isn't one of the lessons learned? We should have done this faster. Uh, why aren't our boosters being rolled out faster? We have procured enough supply for everyone to get boosters. The delivery of those boosters is on the provinces and they are setting up their timelines in terms of that. What we are learning from the UK and others is get people those boosters as quickly as possible because uh, even the current formulation is effective against Omicron so people should be getting their boosters as soon as they can. I guess we need them now is my question. So uh, when you, are they coming? Still, they're coming as soon as we need them. Is there, there a is schedule? Not an, there is a schedule. There are, there, well, there are commitments. Schedule. There are commitments to have the boosters in Canada as soon as we need them. We have enough boosters for everyone, so there's no excuse but not here. for people. But we don't have them here in Canada. I'm just, I'm just trying to, like if all 26 million people Evan, said we want them now. We want them tomorrow, we wouldn't be able to deliver them uh, into 26 million arms right. uh, okay. on tomorrow. Uh, but as soon as we can roll them out, we have enough boosters secured for everyone. Will we need an annual shot? Are you planning, is the government planning for an annual booster? Uh, we don't know how this, this pandemic is going to unfold, which is why we have secured deals for the coming years and years on access to boosters and to shots if necessary. The vaccine equity issue is interesting. I spoke to Dr. Singer from the WHO and he said, look, the WHO is saying don't give rich countries like Canada the third shot when 7% of Africa hasn't even had, the, only 7% has had one shot, maybe even less. What's your view on the morality of that? Taking a third shot for a Canadian, would we know the virus mutates in unvaccinated places and it then boomerangs back to us? Should we be getting a third shot before some get a first? That's, that's a, a, an interesting moral question um, that, that we have gotten around by being one of the most active countries from the beginning on th initiatives like COVAX and the ACT Accelerator to make commitments to donate not just vaccines but money and capacity to the world to be able to do it. We don't produce vaccines in Canada, but my responsibility as Prime Minister of Canada is to make sure that we get enough vaccines to keep Canadians safe as the same time as we're investing in the world, and that's what we're doing. Okay, just last question on, on that. Um, would you cancel your plans for Christmas holidays and, and the holiday now? Because people want to know. People want to travel. It's been two years. Is it time to cancel Christmas again? I think people need to make the right choices for themselves and based on public health information. I'm going to be spending Christmas uh, at the cottage. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, other families will make the decisions that are right for them. High inflation. Two words that will spike the temperature of any politician. And the rising cost of living has been, along with the pandemic, the dominant challenge facing Prime Minister Trudeau. 
and there are no easy immediate solutions. In November, inflation in Canada, 4.7%. That maintains an 18-year high, and the price of food and homes are both projected to increase throughout the new year. Now, the federal government argues this is all a global phenomenon. They're right on that. But citizens regard the federal government as the fire department. They may not have started the fire, but they have the job of putting it out. In this past week, the finance minister, Christian Freeland, attempted to answer that. She released her fiscal update. That projected a $144.5 billion deficit for the new year but it did not contain any new ideas to address the cost of living beyond the long-touted childcare promise. So does the Prime Minister have any new solutions for the inflation crisis hitting everything from homes to groceries? Here's part two of our one-on-one -on -one conversation with Prime Minister Trudeau. Here we are at the end of 2021, and the number one issue is inflation. It's at an eight-year high. You get questions about this every day. People are deeply concerned about the cost of living every day. The answer the government and you've provided a lot is, look, we've got this national child care strategy, every province, and, and, and I, which I understand, but and affordable housing. Those are long-term solutions. What in the short term will your government do to alleviate the pain of inflation? Well, first of all, inflation is a direct consequence of the global COVID crisis. I mean, COVID remains the number one issue people are dealing with. We don't want it to be the number one issue anymore. Everyone's tired of it, but we're dealing with supply chain disruptions and price disruptions related to COVID. And therefore, the number one thing we can do to support people right now in the economy is get done with COVID. And that means continuing the vaccinations, getting people to get their boosters as well. The boosters are strongly effective against Omicron, even as they are right now. We need to keep doing the things we do to get through this crisis so that uh, we can get our economy back to normal, so people can get back to the things they love to do and uh, we can move forward. But what I appreciate that, although uh, and we'll get at the causes of inflation in, in a minute, but are there other short-term levers that the government has? Joe Biden said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do ports in, in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. We're going to go 24 hours a day to alleviate supply chain issues. What will your government oh, do? And we've been doing those sorts of things, money directly for ports to accelerate uh, the disruption, the, to minimize the disruptions in supply chains, uh, reach out to give more support to people where needed. Uh, there, are, there are lots of things we're continuing to do uh, to support people who are affected by COVID, to support families, to support individuals. Yes, childcare and housing are a big part that are gonna help it, but there is, there's always more to do and we're looking at it. But one thing you could do, one question is, is stimulus a part of the inflation? Not the cause, we know there's a global cause because we see inflation all over the, the world. But your government also says, look, we've recovered more jobs mm -hmm. than we've lost. Yes. The economy's growing, it's yes. roaring back. So if it's roaring back, is it time to rein in the spending? That's, that's an argument that's being made by conservatives right now. One of the things that we all remember in the 2008 reception, recession, Conservatives pulled back the support too quickly, and that recession lingered longer than it needed to. Um, we promised to be there to support people through COVID and all its impacts, and that's what we're doing. So the supports for small businesses, the supports for families, the supports for vulnerable people, we're gonna to continue to do them, even as we make fiscally responsible investments in things that will make a difference in the long term. Again, you're talking about three years here uh, about, of stimulus. What's your projection for how long inflation, uh, this inflation uh, situation lasts? The governor of the bank says it's um, not short-lived. Mm. Transitory but not short-lived was his phrase he told me. We want to minimize it. And what you're calling stimulus over the next few years, we're calling indispensable supports for the tourism sector, supports for hard-hit cultural industries that are still affected by the pandemic. We're not going to start pulling away those supports because we know Canada came into this, this COVID challenge with one of the best best fiscal uh, situations of the G7, and we still have one of the healthiest balance books uh, of all our peer countries. We're continuing to put it to the investments necessary because it's not just a way to get through the health crisis. It actually lets our economy bounce back strongest and best. But th there's a cost to that. You know, $497 billion, right? That, mm -hmm. Those are massive spending numbers, okay? Yes. 
under your terms since 2015, the deficit has more, or the debt has almost doubled. So you say you have Canadians' backs now. Mm -hmm. What about the backs of the kids who have to pay for it in the next generation? The cost of servicing that debt is lower now than it was a few years ago before COVID. We are doing this in a fiscally responsible way. And there was a decision to make in the beginning of the pandemic of do we massively support people through this or do we hold back our firepower to help people out of it? Conservatives said we needed to show restraint, not help people so much now because we need it more later. We said, no, no, we're going to help them right now. And actually what that has shown in countries that did like Canada is the recovery is quicker and better and people are better off. The choice of helping people more, of having their backs, was the right one, you're regardless looking, okay, of what critics but, said. But there was widely, uh, wide agreement at that at the time. But let's, you're looking in the rearview mirror, let's just look out the windshield because mm -hmm. I, I want to look ahead. Someone's got to pay for that. The underlying assumption about interest rates for you, and I think it's at risky one, Prime Minister, is that interest rates will always remain lower than the growth. Historically, that's not the case. Growth could be significantly less than interest rates. If interest rates go up, then we are in a structural deficit. Are you worried about structural deficits? I think it's always a mistake to try and bet against Canadians. Uh, what the, we're making is investments now. Talk about childcare, talk about renewables, talk about uh, about uh, the digital economy. But the investments we're making now. You can't, you no, can't no, call spending always betting against, for Canadians. You, you okay. have to also be That's responsible right. with your spending. Absolutely. So let's talk about childcare. That's $30 billion. That's a big part of the investments we've talked about. Not only is it good for families and moms specifically, not only is it good for kids and giving them an opportunity, it's also something that allows for growth in the workforce and significant growth of our economy. So th yes, that's a big upfront number that we're spending. And quite frankly, uh, Aaron O'Toole said, don't do it, he would rip up those programs. He doesn't think that's a worthwhile spending. I believe it is because it ends up returning more to the economy. Do you worry about the deficit? Let's yes. just be, okay. Of course I do. You've been prime minister for six years. You, you once promised you'd balance it. Those promises have you've never come to. In fact, it's gone the other way. Now, there are circumstances, let's be fair. We understand the pandemic. But there is no fiscal guardrail. What do you have ever have a plan to get back to balance that Absolutely. is realistic? We need to continue shrinking our debt as a size of our GDP. We need to make sure that the amount we owe as a proportion of the economy continues to decline. And that's exactly what we're doing. Even with all the extra investments and spending we've made now, uh, our fiscally responsible track remains it. And you know, politicians always have debates over whether or not they're responsible or that responsible. Let's look at the third party experts. Look at the, the credit rating agencies. Canada has kept a AAA rating uh, from some of the largest agencies because our track is sustainable. Cost of living and affordability is slightly different than inflation, I get that, but let's talk about inflation in housing, which is the other big issue. Mm -hmm. It's since 2015 when you were elected, the average house price has gone up 77%. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about who's to blame for that. Low interest rates, uh, there's lots of incentives to buy houses. What will your government do on a material level yeah. to help people buy houses and, and to stop the housing prices from inflating. Well, one of the things we need to do is create more supply and that's why we put forward a plan in the last election to invest four billion dollars to municipalities to help accelerate the creation of supply of uh, creating more low income and modest uh, uh, income rental housing. Uh, in, in cut down some of the red tape, provide federal lands to build on, move things forward in a way that incentivizes the creation of more housing, not just so housing prices can go down, but so that we can continue to bring in immigrants to, continue, to contribute to our workforce. The problem is, and I spoke to Evan Sedell, the former president of and CEO of the CMHC, who you know, yes. and I asked him about this program, the, the Home Buyers Incentive and the fund, the $4 billion. He said it's a multi-trillion dollar housing market, it, that will, it's too small to make a difference. That will not truly impact supply, maybe at the margins. He just doesn't believe that's enough. There's too many other factors, especially low interest rates. One thing he said that would really deal with housing inequity is a capital gains tax, not retroactive, but going forward on primary residences. Would you ever consider that? That's not something we're looking at. 
Uh, we are, however, in agreement with both you and, and Evan in that there is no one silver bullet that's going to fix housing. We need a range of programs, whether it's eliminating blind bidding and uh, cutting down on predatory uh, practices, whether it's uh, investing in things like the portable housing benefit that we have for low-income families, the Canada Housing Benefit, whether it's incentives for first-time home buyers that are helping them afford the cost of their mortgage and their down payment. There have to be a range of things, both on the demand backfire. side and the supply okay, side. Okay, but um, that's interesting because one of the issues is that economists say that when you do do things like increase, I don't know, reduce the mortgage insurance payment or the first-time homeowner's tax credit, that makes it easier to buy home. That incentivizes people. The problem is that increases demand, that inflates the house price and, and shorts the supply. The yeah. very things you're doing are the very things that may be causing the inflationary pressure. They could if it weren't for the fact that we're very aware of those challenges around. If, simply put, if you give everyone an extra thousand dollars to buy a house, all the prices go up by an right. extra thousand well. dollars. So you have to be very careful about how you do it. And that's why we're designing programs that aren't easy, that aren't uh, explainable in a, in a three minute clip, that actually support specific parts and segments of the market to be able to challenge the problems they're facing. Like young people who are seeing it further and further away to be able to buy their first homes, there are measures you can put in, that we are putting in, that are going to accelerate the rate at which young people, young couples can buy their first home and start building that equity. When a popular grade three teacher in Quebec lost her teaching job because she wears a hijab, there was outrage across the country. How could this happen in Canada? Well, this was not a bug in the Quebec secularization law known as Bill 21. This was the feature, the very purpose of it. After all, the law bans provincial employees, teachers or judges from wearing any religious symbol. But the teacher put a real face to the law and that sparked protests and responses. Mayors of big cities are now raising money to help fight the law that all federal leaders have essentially dismissed as an internal Quebec matter. But does that response hold up? And that's not the only issue facing the Prime Minister now. How does he deal with China after announcing a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Beijing Olympics? And is he ready for a trade war with the U.S. over protectionism? To talk about all these issues and his own political future, will he run again? I sat down with Prime Minister Trudeau. Here's part three of that conversation. China. Uh, we are now have a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics. Uh, the two Michaels. The crackdown on Hong Kong. The U.S. and the U.K. think there's a genocide going on against the Uyghurs, uh, the Muslim minority, as do the opposition parties. As do the well, Parliament of Canada. Do you believe there's a genocide? I believe there needs to be a full investigation in it. I believe there are human rights violations that need to be exposed and accounted for, and uh, we need to make sure Is that... Is that a dodge, though? Does that, no, does it's that, not. I only ask you that because it means that we need an investigation. China says, sorry, no one's getting an investigation, so it's a uh, paralysis but where, it's not, where because the, the we've U.S. Already, has enough evidence and the U.K. has enough evidence. We've already laid out very clearly the consequences for the human rights violations that are going on in China right now uh, and we're going to continue to act strongly on that but the word genocide is such a significantly loaded word we we know there needs to be a proper investigation into these allegations of uh, of genocide that's something that China needs to uh, needs to accept and we're going to continue to increase pressure on them until they do the US ambassador to Canada David Cohen told me the other day that the biggest threat right now to the US is China on foreign policy What's your answer to that question? Uh, China is a, a significant challenge, uh, but so is the rise of authoritarian states. So are cyber attacks. Uh, so is uh, Russia in, in the Ukraine. So is, you know, there are many, many international challenges to democracies like Canada, uh, to our open trading system in the world that is affected by the supply chain challenges. There are many, many challenges out there. China is certainly one of them. Will we do more business with China or less business? I think China is growing and continuing to have a significant impact on the world stage. We will continue to do business with China. We need to make sure that we are at the same time challenging and contesting China on human rights and on its, its behaviors. Will you take other um, um, actions against China? Would you do uh, different kinds of sanctions against China now? Because clearly they don't care. They've said they're going to take countermeasures against Canada. 
Uh, they've also warned you don't ban Huawei. You're three years. We've been waiting for that decision. Uh, some are saying that it looks like we're scared of China. When are you going to stand up to China? What we have done every step of the way is work as part of a global community because you're absolutely right. Canada's voice alone isn't significant, but the way we were able to bring home the Michaels uh, was to see countries around the world bringing up the case of the arbitrary detained Canadians in uh, bilateral conversations with Chinese leadership that did make an impact, and that's where pulling together as a world to be united in our values and our approach makes a big difference and Canada is leading on that. U.S. protectionism is the other big threat. They have a $12,500 tax credit they've proposed for electric vehicles made in the U.S. that would absolutely cripple the Canadian industry. I know there's a, a threat of a trade war now that we're going to sanction. How soon could tariffs on U.S. goods happen and are you prepared for a trade war with the U.S.? We have seen over the past years that Canadians are ready to stand up for themselves. We stood up successfully on steel and aluminum tariffs. We renegotiated NAFTA under very difficult situations. We will always stand up for our workers. At the same time, we know that Canadians and Americans have been building cars together for over 50 years, and it's not just in our interest, it's in their interest as well. So we're looking for a solution to be did able to solve this. Did you tell Joe Biden? Absolutely. Did Those you are tell, the exact did, words that I used. Did you tell him that we'll, if you put that tax credit, we'll put tariffs on your goods equal? Nobody wants a trade war between Canada and the United States. There's so many other things going on that we are looking to find a solution to it, but we will always stand up for Canadian workers. Across the river where we are, uh, we are today, there was a, a young grade three teacher who was fired from her job because she wore a hijab because of the controversial Bill 21, the secularism issue. Uh, none of the federal leaders have done much to stand up for it. I know you've threatened to join the federal court case, but everyone said this is in Quebec. If you believe this is discriminatory, and you've said it... I've said it. I've, I've been clear so from the very beginning on how much I've disagreed. How if it's discrimination? Why is dis if you believe it's discrimination, why let it go? Because the best place to be fighting this as a first step is for Quebecers themselves to be challenging this unjust law in their courts that their provincial government Why put forward. Why is that forward. the best way? In, Why shouldn't the federal, what stops the federal government? What's the moratorium on fighting discrimination? What is, what is a better outcome to have a Quebec government fighting a federal government or a Quebec government having to dis defend its unjust law against its own citizens. It is That's much more... That's a political answer to no, a legal, it's not. legal no, issue it's not. because it rights, there's a young teacher that lost yes. her job and if yes. you believe that's discrimination. Isn't it incumbent on you and the federal government to protect the Charter of Rights, not let them use the notwithstanding clause, and take a stand and say, we're with you? Uh, we have taken very clear stands that this bill is, is wrong. We have also said that we are not putting aside the possibility of challenging it at the Supreme Court. Can you just explain this to Fino Trip? I mean it, because you had said, you know, look, everyone in the world has lapses of judgment. When, when, you did the, when you had those issues of blackface in the election, you said, I've got to examine myself, I've got to look at, into my privilege and, and reflect. Then on the first day of, for, to, to talk about truth and reconciliation, you took the family trip to Tofino, you flew over Kamloops. It was obviously you apologized for it, you recognized it was an insulting thing to do. Why'd you do it? We had an event the night before on Parliament Hill to raise the reconciliation flag and that morning I made phone calls uh, all morning to survivors uh, of, of uh, residential schools to hear from them. Uh, I should have done more, I should have gone to Kamloops and when I went there a couple of weeks later I apologized and I was glad to be there for that but it was uh, a mistake to have done. Uh, what does it tell you about, I mean being Prime Minister you live in a bubble. Maybe people don't speak truth to power, they're scared to say to you Hey, PM, this is a very bad call. What does it say about your, your you keep saying I gotta reflect on this stuff to make that decision. What does it tell you about, maybe a gut check about your judgment? Listen, we're all gonna make mistakes. And the important thing is, is to recognize them and try to rectify them. But I think throughout the, the, the years of working on reconciliation, throughout the years of working on progressive policies for Canadians, we've had far more successes than we've had mistakes, but of course there have been mistakes. Here's a rapid fire question. Three elections. Mm -hmm. Is Justin Trudeau going to run again? Yes. You are going to run oh, again. We, no we, walks come, in the snow, no. no. Com coming out of this pandemic, uh, we have an opportunity uh, to go even 
further and even faster on things like climate change, reconciliation, growing the economy in ways that support the middle class. We've, we've come through a difficult time. There is a, an energy, even though everyone's exhausted, there is a capacity to do really big things in the coming years, and I'm really excited about serving Canadians. So you're running again? Yes. What will define 2022? Uh, I think the uh, hopefully getting out of this pandemic, leaving it behind us, uh, being able to uh, start accelerating on the fight against climate change even more than we already are, accelerate on reconciliation, accelerate on developing an economy that works for everyone in the 21st century with all the lessons we learned through this pandemic.